There's nothing to worry about, Granny Rodder said. The expression didn't match her confident words. She kept reading and rereading the text letter. Nothing to worry about at all. Granny, do we have $150,000? Daphne asked. The old woman shook herself out of days. I'm sorry, Libby, what do you say? Do we have the money to pay the taxes? So Granny flinched at the question, like she had been stung by a bee. We'll be fine, girls, she said to them, but Sabrina was already nervous. During her time in the orphanage and later in dozens of foster homes, she had acquired the ability to recognize a lying adult. Later that evening, the girls dressed in their white martial arts robes called Jesus. Their uniform consisted of white pants and a robe shirt with a sash of colored cloth used as a belt. Sabrina helped her Daphne wrap her brown belt around her waist and then tied her round own yellow one. The colors represented levels of expertise. Brown was for beginners, yellow was more advanced. Once the girls were ready, they met Puck in the hallway. Dressed in his usual jeans and green hooded sweatshirt, he had a big black scarf wrapped around his waist. I think you have to earn your black belt, Daphne said. Ro- uh, Puck rolled his eyes. I'm already the best butt kicker in this town. They don't even have a color for how good I am. Sabrina shrugged and unlocked the spare room door that led to her sleeping parents and mirror. After kissing her parents on the cheek, Sabrina led the others to the reflection, where they found Mira sitting in a chair and drinking a glass of brandy and some expensive chocolates. Snow's down the hall, he said, pointing. Have fun. The children walked away, Mira had pointed, and soon found the gorgeous teacher waiting for them near the rooms that held magical hands and two fairy teeth. Snow wore a white robe like the girls, with a black wa- belt wrapped around her waist. She had her long dark hair tied up in a bun and was barefoot. Hello, children, she said, bowing. Hello, Sensei, Sabrina and Daphne said together as they bowed back to her. Puck, however, was picking his nose. Tonight we are going to continue to work on our blocking, Miss White said. Puck let out an exasperated groan. Again, when are we going to learn to punch someone in the face? Snow White sighed. Puck, I told you when you were asked to join the girls' training sessions that the martial arts are not about attack, they're about defense. Well, I'm starting my own martial art then, he said. It's called Puck Fu, and there's only one move you need to learn the knuckle sandwich. Well, I wish you luck with that, but Mrs. Grimm and I feel that. But Mrs. Grimm and I feel that a girl should learn to defend themselves against attackers, Miss White said. Now, everyone, let's get into our defensive stance. Miss White moved among the group, throwing training punches that allowed the children to block her attacks with ease. As, she, as the night rolled on, the attacks become, became more forceful. They walked on close-handed and open-handed blocks, how to step aside to avoid a punch, and how to use their own wrists to stop an assault. Miss White was a patient teacher, but Sabrina could tell she was a bit preoccupied. She knew that Charmy's disappearance was weighing heavy on Miss White's heart. Sabrina she wanted to reach out to her. What could she say? She suddenly felt sympathy for Snow's worries and broken heart. But Charmy was a jerk. He had never done anything that wasn't in his own interest. He'd only ever helped the Grimms to impress Miss White or to advance his own career. Sabrina wondered that what the teacher even saw in the pompous blowhard. Sure, he was breathtakingly handsome, but once he opened his mouth, he turned into a first-class lout. Still, she felt she should say something. He'll, t- he'll turn up, she said softly. Miss White looked as if she were fighting back tears. I hope so, she whispered, then told the children she would see them in a couple of days for their next class. The girls walked with her out of the Hall of Wonders, downstairs, and then outside, waving when her uh, car pulled out of the driveway. Sabrina closed the door and went to the dining room where Puck was wolfing down some kind of soup. 
There was another table from Granny explaining that she had gone to bed early, that Mr. Candace was in her room, and that Uncle Jake had and gone out for the night. She advised the children to have as much soup as they wanted, and then to get to work researching tiny people and, and that and any small animals that might be what that might be capable of stealing magical items. Sabrina was dumbfounded. After the run-in with Nottingham and the news of the tax assessment, she had completely forgotten they were even involved in the mystery. She must be worried, Daphne said as she peered into the pot. There's nothing pop on the food. Sabrina poured some soup into a bowl for her sister and then did the same for herself. Then they sat with Puck, who, after several threats, surrendered a few of the rolls he had been hoarding. You better be nice to me, Piggy, Puck said with a mouthful of soup. When you two are homeless, you're going to want to live with me in the forest, and I'm not going to let just anyone live in my forest. Are we really going to be homeless? Daphne asked. No, Sabrina said. Don't lie to her, Puck chimed in. Things are bleak, Marshmallow. If I were you, I'd eat as much of this soup as you can. And it might be the last meal you get for a long time. Hobos have to eat out of garbage cans and beg for crusts of bread in the street. I don't want to be a hobo, Daphne said, then turned to her sister. What's a hobo? Sabrina ignored the question and got from the table. Give me that roll and I'll find you a nice warm refrigerator box to sleep in. Puck said. Daphne, don't listen to him, Sabrina said. Daphne glanced at her sister, but surrendered her role to the boy. We need to get to work, Sabrina said with a sigh. Well, that's my cue, Puck said as he pushed back from the, a table. He at once claimed he was allergic to books, and people who t- t- tried to approve their, improve their minds were just admitting stupidity. He tr- flew off to his room and felt and left the girls alone. Sabrina went to the bookshelves to begin her search for anything on Little Thieves. She found some books by Tiny Tim, Thumbelina, and one titled Life is Futile by Itsy Bitsy Spider. She scooped them all up, set them on the table, then went back to scan the collection of family journals. Every groom since Wilhelm, the man who brought the ever afters to Fairy Point Landing, and documented his or her experiences in the town. Each journal was packed with eyewitness accounts, and they frequently proved very helpful in solving cases. For hours, Sabrina and Daphne pored over their old books. They read about the Mouse King of Oz, who ruled a million mice, sorted through the various campaigns of an army of tin soldiers, and learned about the history of Lilliput. But they found nothing concrete, and soon they came to a dead end. It was very late, and they were very tired. Even Elvis was asleep under the table. I thought detective work was supposed to be exciting, Sabrina said, closing the book that lay before her. I'm excited. I'm excited, Daphne said. You're always excited, Sabrina replied. Resting her head on the giant oak dining room table, they used as a desk. Granny has probably solved this case already and won't tell us what she knows. We're training, Daphne reminded her. She wants us to figure this out for ourselves. She wants to drive us crazy. This town is filled to the brim with talking animals and tiny people, not to mention witches who might be able to shrink themselves. How can we narrow it down? We'll figure it out, Daphne said. Remember, we're a great team. Sabrina was tired, but she had to smile. Come on, Elvis, you've probably got to go out, Sabrina said as she got up from the table. The big dog nearly knocked Sabrina over as he charged from the front door. Sabrina sh- opened it and Elvis barreled out. Don't go far, she shouted at the dog, then crossed back through the dining room on her way to the kitchen. I'm getting some water, she said to her, her sister. Want anything? Daphne shook her head. She was half asleep with her head resting on a big book about a village in Oz whose citizens were made of jigsaw puzzle pieces. Sabrina went into the kitchen, took a glass from the cu- from the cupboard, and opened it for the refrigerator. Inside, there were several containers of leftovers, a package of bologna, and a bowl with a little sign on it that read, 
Danger! Sausages! Keep away from Elvis at all costs! Sabrina knew the explosive effect they had on the dog. She reached down, she reached past them for the jug of water her uncle kept in the fridge. She poured some into her glass. Tilting her head back, she took a long, refreshing drink and let the cool liquid cascade down her throat. Then she heard Elvis' angry bark. She peered out of the kitchen window and saw the big dog growling and barking at the edge of the woods. Puck was probably in the backyard preparing another humiliating trap for her. Or maybe Elvis was spooked by the odd swirling clouds hovering over the house. Elvis hated thunder and lightning and often hid under the girl's bed during particularly loud storms. She tried to put the jug back in the refrigerator but spun back around when she heard a loud cry. Sabrina bolted to, to the window. There in the moonlight, she saw her Uncle Jake running through the yard. He looked panicked. Suddenly, there was a whooping sound and he crashed to the ground. An arrow stuck in his back. Chapter 4 Sabrina dropped her glass and it shattered on the kitchen floor. The crash snapped her off her so- shock and she sprang to action. She raced into the uh, dining room, pulled her sister on a chair, and shoved her under the table. Stay here, she ordered, then ran for the front door, shouting for Granny and Mr. Candice. In her bare feet, she raced outside and let and around the corner into the backyard. She found her uncle lying face down. Sabrina gently turned him over and he let out a groan. Uncle Jake, she cried, though looking at him closely, she wasn't positive that he was her uncle. There was something wrong with his face. He had a goatee and a large scar on his neck, and it looked as if a rope had been tied around it. His hair was gray on the sides, and his eyes seemed dull. He was clearly in a great deal of pain. Brina? Granny and Mr. Candace are going to help you. They're on their way, Sabrina said through sobs. Brina, you look so young, he said. You look just like you did when you were twelve. He's raving from the pain, Sabrina thought to herself. He needs a doctor right away. Someone help us, she yelled. The storm above was incredibly loud, so she shouted again. She climbed to her feet and turned to the house. Help! Elvis joined her cries with baleful barking, and in no time, Granny and Mr. Candace were rushing out of the house. Liebling, what is the matter? Granny begged. She was in her nightgown and slippers and a green mud mask on her face. It's Uncle Jake. He's been hurt, Granny cried, turning to the fallen man. But there was no sign of him. Bewildered, Sabrina scanned the edge of the woods. How could he have crawled away so quickly and without her noticing? She studied the lawn, searching for a trail of blood, but there was nothing. But he was lying right here on the ground. I saw him. I saw the arrow. He was dying. Elvis rushed to the place where Uncle Jacob had been lying. He sniffed the ground and whined. Child, you are mistaken, Kenneth said. I can smell such things. No one has been injured. Sabrina, it's late. You must have been having a bad dream, Granny said. Your opa base are used to walking asleep too. No, I saw him. He was right here. We have to look for him, she cried. Uncle Jacob walked around from the front of the house. He was his normal self. No scar on his neck and no goatee. What's all the commotion? Sabrina suddenly felt woozy. Her eyes filled with little flashes of light and her face grew hot. You were hurt, she tried to say, but then everything went black. When Sabrina woke the next morning, she felt as if she had been asleep for a hundred years. She was groggy and awkward, and her legs felt like cooked spaghetti as she descended the steps to join her family for breakfast. (coughs) (coughs) When she saw that Uncle Jake was walking his way through a box of donuts, she began to wonder if her grandmother was right. Maybe the entire... That seems to be the end of this video. I'll send more later. Actually, I think this is going to be the last one for tonight. Anyways, goodbye.